Per usual, you're on this channel for educational purposes only and is not intended as financial advice. It is Macro Monday, doing a double header. It's Labor Day in the United States, but the show must go on. Looking at the weekly crypto asset flows, they tipped negative. Not really much going on week over week here. What we really want to see is consistency. We do not want to see spikes, peaks, troughs, just consistent flows, much like we did in the beginning of the year. And we're not quite there yet. That's one thing to watch for. From Q3 into Q4, as far as the economic data in the U.S. for the week, it's a big week for employment data. Job openings, jolts, we got ISM, PMI, ADP, jobless claims, unemployment at the end of the week with wages, and then we have some Fed speakers. So all sorts of fun stuff on the employment side of things. On the inflation side, I'm still hearing and seeing people say, we're going to see this rip roar in inflation. Depending on who gets into office post election, we may see that depending on their policies. But the real time estimate for inflation continues to crush lows. If we see inflation ticking up at all, it will be evident here first. This changes every day. It's the most sensitive indicator for inflation in the United States. And we're not seeing that, we're seeing the opposite. We're seeing disinflationary forces, and we're on the verge of deflation. I don't think we'll quite go negative on trueflation, but direction of this has been pretty clear year to date, and that has been down. Uh, direction of CPI has been down. This week isn't CPI, but the week after, we do have a CPI print core CPI as well. And then we have FOMC the week after that. So the FOMC meeting will encompass both unemployment and CPI, their dual mandate. And uh, we will know better whether or not it's going to be a 25 or 50 this week, most likely. It's going to take a lot of negative data from employment, I think, to switch the expectations, to shift the expectations from a 25 to a 50 on the 18th of a cut. And if we're being honest with ourselves, we don't want to see that. We don't want to see quick panic cuts. We want to see normalization cuts. So what do we want to see this week from the employment data? We want to see softening but not dramatic weakening. That's pretty much it. Goldilocks, right? Looking at inflation for this upcoming print uh, CPI cores is going to be down. Now, some people, even on the PCE, right, they want to see six months of sub 2% before the Fed cuts. And I don't know what planet they're in that they want that because that's not how this works. You don't start steering an ocean liner at port, okay? You got to wait or you got to get ahead of it because it takes a while to turn the ship. So it's going to take a while to turn the ship. And just because we're cutting doesn't mean we're not going to continue to see job losses or continue to see disinflation. So it's a bit absurd, I think, to continue to wait to cut, just like the Fed was extremely late to hike. They're already probably a little late to cut here, just based on how the meetings are on the calendar, on the year, right? We won't have another meeting after September until after the election. And it doesn't need to be a 25 every time. They raised 75 clips, 50 clips. Like to see a 75 cut, I don't think would be a panic cut either come November. And we're not going to get inflation from oil because oil uh, is still at lows looking to go lower. We're not seeing any concern here on the oil price from anything that's going on in the Middle East or in Europe or in the Red Sea, we're not seeing a dramatic rise, even with technicals suggesting a rise in oil. So we're not going to see that anytime in the near term. Uh, GDP also flipping higher. And, you know, you can get people saying labor data is fake, inflation's fake, everything's fake. Okay, fine. Well, I can't trade fake. I can trade the numbers in front of me. And GDP thus far looks okay. We get an update to this uh, tomorrow. So that's something to watch this week as well. But so far, so good. Before I go any further here, let me mention today's video sponsor, Kraken Pro. Kraken Pro is a complete overhaul of the Kraken trading experience with a one-stop shop for advanced and professional traders. Kraken Pro enables efficient trading execution across multiple markets with a UI that allows for unique optimization tailored to your trading style. You can check out Kraken Pro with a link in the description of this video. Not investment advice, crypto trading involves risk of loss. Cryptocurrency services are provided to U.S. U.S. territory customers by Payward Ventures, Inc., PVI, DBA, Kraken. And although Kraken doesn't yet have 
non-crypto markets on the exchange. I think that they will come eventually. The theme of this video is going to be the melding of legacy and TradFi. Now that we are this alternative asset class, we will be looked at by the quant shops who weren't already looking at us just because of access and regulations and the BlackRock blessing through the ETF markets. And there's a clear standout when you compare legacy markets, even the MAG7, commodities, pick whatever you want, compare any of that stuff to Bitcoin, and uh, it's no contest, which is why most of us are still here and have been here for quite a while. But in the near term, as I said in the earlier video today, trend metrics are not favorable for anything, really. If anything, this uh, still leans bearish. We're still making slightly lower lows. We're still making lower highs. By definition, that is bearish, okay? The cloud is less powerful when we are ranging, so the signals will be more noisy, and we can always bump this up on the time frames to see what this looks like. And all of this just says, do nothing. Do nothing, have some cash ready to go just in case this breaks down, right? If this breaks 40 for whatever reason, we can imagine things uh, the election, uh, unemployment data is bad, recessions quicker than we expect, whatever, pick something. I don't think there's a reason to be all in right here, right now. Me personally, I have no problem adding at each higher high all the way up to all time high. I have no problem whatsoever because here as we sit, it's still a bit murky on direction. I'm bullish. I think this flips bullish. I think this March is bullish in Q4, but if I'm wrong, I want to have some cash for sub 50 in case we go down to that region. I'll also mention the Kraken desktop app, currently in open beta. If you want to get on the next round of invites, I would sign up for that. I'll put a link for this in the description of the video as well. It's even more customizable, even more modular than Kraken Pro. All right, back to legacy yields. Not much has changed week over week. We're still seeing yields largely come down. The long end is still being a bit stubborn. The short end, of course, is decided by the Fed. And so that's likely to come down here in short order over the next couple of weeks, over the next several months, this should continue to come down. And there's been a lot of macro bears counting down the days on the 10-2 yield curve inversion. And I see it, I see multiple accounts every day tweeting this out that the, you know, the sky is falling, end is near. Well, that may be true eventually. Again, we're not seeing that based on the data that I was looking at so far. Now, unemployment may spike. We may see labor data get real bad, and that would be very concerning. And we'll find out, right? But I think it's way too early to just say, yes, this is inverting. It's uninverting, rather. It's a guaranteed recession, especially because the creator of this indicator, his whole focus was not the 10-2, but the 10-3 yield curve, inversion, and uninversion. So I asked, I asked ChatGPT, what's the difference? Well, the difference is, of course, in the 10-2 being a normalization of economic conditions, but not necessarily concerns about recession. Whereas uninversion of the 10-3 suggesting a different story. So don't take my word for it. Listen to Cam Harvey. He's done tons of interviews on this. He's written tons of papers on this. So I wouldn't just assume because we are uninverting here on the 10-2 that it is a slam dunk recession. And it's probably not even fair to assume that when the 10-3 uninverts, it's a slam dunk recession. But we're certainly closer probably to a recession when the 10-3 uninverts versus the 10-2. You can see the lag here, the delay in the 10-2 recession call, which is backwards looking. This gets a little wonky, I know, but the TLDR is, look, you're going to see a lot of these charts this week. I'm not going to panic. Okay, <laughs> because we're not seeing that. We're not seeing recession that I'm seeing in the data. You know, you can go out there anecdotally. You can find all sorts of data points. If you're the one paying the interest right now, yeah, you're getting squeezed hard. But it's definitely a tale of two cities. Looking at the S&P, you'd have no idea. The yield curve is uninverting. Doesn't really care. You'd have no idea that uh, there's any employment concerns here. We have seen three, three, other than this current bullish TK recross with price above cloud, three TK recrosses since 2023, all of which have led to higher highs. So again, it's hard to be bearish here. Look at the TA, look at the data. This is a breakout trade. This is a low time frame inverted head and shoulders. It says if we start to curl up beyond all time highs, the next stop is 
in the 6,000s on the S&P. And that would really anger a lot of bears who already believe this market is way overbought, too expensive. You can go down the list, you know, but the TA is the TA. Until we're below the cloud, until the metrics are bearish, it's hard to be bearish. This is not, by the way, what we're seeing in crypto. Crypto is mostly the opposite of this, making lower lows in a down channel. This is clearly an up channel. This is clearly sitting at all-time highs ready to go. Something else to watch on the BTC side of things is when does Bitcoin finally catch a bid relative to the S&P? This is Bitcoin divided by SPY. And a really good alert would to just draw be to draw a line here and set an alert on that diagonal resistance. Probably in the 106 to 114 region is where we're going to see that. But we saw something similar September, October in 2023. Now, the difference then is we definitely had a surge of liquidity. We had the ETFs. We had having stuff. Now, we don't really have much of that other than just this expectation that liquidity is going to improve. Rates are coming down. Money printer go burr, that sort of thing. So it's a little different. I don't think the catalysts are as clear this time, but the chart is the chart. And it's just one more thing to add to the list of when does this look more bullish? Well, when this doesn't look like we're losing ground against the S&P, which we should if this breaks up, we should probably continue to lose ground against the S&P this week. And we can look at the queues as well. The queues look similar. This is clear, clearly an uptrend and it looks fine on the daily. You don't have a bullish DK cross just yet, but you probably will this week. You can go on a lower time frame, go on a four hour, some sort of cup and handily inverted head and shouldery thing, right? But it's not bearish at all. Anytime we've tried to get bearish over the past two years, just everyone's buying the dip, buying the dip, buying the dip. This doesn't have to continue, but it certainly looks more bullish than bearish to me. Seasonality for legacy in September is just as poor as crypto. It makes sense. It's the same markets here. It's not like we're on two different planets, but this is not bearish. This is not bearish at all. Even if we look at something like Bitcoin versus NVIDIA, we go pound for pound, punch for punch here. Post having historically, we do see a reversal around 150 to 300 days after having. Clearly, this isn't a downtrend. Bitcoin's in a downtrend relative to NVIDIA. Has been for years now. And this is another reason why we on the crypto side do not want NVIDIA breaking out. We do not want legacy even breaking out. We want MAG7 to chill out. We want the breadth low caps to come back to the table because then we can be a part of that conversation. Right now, people don't need to go down the risk curve because they're getting all their returns from the top names. So why would you bother? But we may still see the breadth that we need to push the queues higher, to push S&P higher. DJI made an all-time high last week. IWM still far down as a laggard there, but it's still trying to make higher highs. So we look good there. We can also look at Bitcoin relative to the other MAG7. This is a great chart from Equinometrics. Returns versus sharp ratio. Sharp ratio punishes you for upside volatility. Sortino ratio does not. So I'd love to see a Sortino chart on this. But this is part of the discussion. Again, this is comparing Bitcoin to the MAG7, ETH to the MAG7 plus gold. Risk adjusted returns for ETH sort of in the mix of the MAG7. So again, why, right? Bitcoin way up here. NVIDIA, best sharp ratio, extremely high returns clearly the winner outright. But this is a type of thing. If we want institutional money, this is what you need to look at. Correlation is another big one, but the Sortino ratio would be super interesting to look up. Look on that chart as well, or something like that. Looking at the DXY, we're still in the range here. It bounced from that 100 psychological level last week. It had been just dying week over week, right? So it makes sense. It's, it's going to take some time if that's going to continue. Sub 100, Certainly doesn't look bullish, it looks oversold, if anything, but it's definitely not bullish. And it makes sense that Bitcoin hasn't broken out until the dollar breaks down. You know, that, that makes a lot of sense. If we see DXY below 100, then we can all have a party and a good time because that means Bitcoin probably is breaking up. Real rates are something else to consider and think about. Real rates are also coming down. Gold sniffing that out already, but that should help Bitcoin as well down the road here into Q4. Liquidity already rising past all-time highs. Stable coin. Market cap 
also rising past all-time highs, whereas the crypto side of the equation is going the opposite direction. It is more correlated with U.S. liquidity and the white there recently. But eventually, this alligator, these alligator jaws, should close for crypto and global liquidity, for crypto and stablecoin liquidity. It'd be one thing if everything was pointing down, but we're not seeing that. And as long as the dollar continues to weaken, we should see liquidity globally continue to jump. We still have the Fed taking assets off their balance sheet, QT versus QE, adding assets to the balance sheet. This was 08, right? 08 was nothing compared to COVID. And we aren't even back to the post-COVID bump of total balance sheet. So I don't know what they're going to do over time here, right? And this is why we Bitcoin. We Bitcoin because we assume this is only going to go higher. We assume U.S. federal debt at uh, 35 trillion is only going to continue to go higher. And that's why hard assets should continue to do well. It's that simple. So any language on the 18th from the Fed about QT versus QE, you know, why are they cutting if they still have an active QT program? How long are they going to continue that QT program? Are they going to continue to taper the QT program? Those are all things to listen for and watch for on the 18th. One other troubling thing from the U.S. liquidity perspective, a few people have mentioned this, we're seeing reverse repo gobble up USD again. This is likely because short-term rates are going to be underneath overnight rates, short-term rates in terms of treasuries. And you'll remember that reverse repo drain is positive for liquidity. Reverse repo gaining assets would mean liquidity coming out of the ecosystem. So it's definitely something to keep a close eye on into Q4, but with the dollar weakening, it may not matter. But if the dollar doesn't weaken sufficiently and we have reverse repo gaining ground here, that may be too much of a liquidity imbalance to overcome for risk assets to do well in Q4. Some more jobs data. Another thing to watch is the jobless claims. We are not seeing spikes in jobless claims. We're not seeing, at least in initial jobless claims, we're not seeing levels similar to recessionary levels dating back to the 70s. And there are lots of these data points where we just don't quite look like a typical recession. And we could very well be in a recession, many aspects of the economy are, and not see these data points. But this is the data, right? We're not seeing this crazy jump in initial jobless claims. This is another puzzling one, jolts, job openings, which we're going to get this week versus the S&P. Generally, this is correlated pretty closely, but recently this has diverged quite a bit. Is this the AI miracle? Is this the AI bubble? Is this just nature healing itself after COVID? We'll see, right? But the scary thing is here, if jolts continues, job openings continues to drop, what is the, is there a maximum divergence? Will this snap back? Or is this just a forever relationship that won't converge again, right? We'll see. But uh, this does, this isn't exactly conducive towards thinking, yeah, markets can just keep going, keep going, keep going with the S&P and the turquoise there. A lot of charts about what happens after the first Fed cut, what happens to markets, what happens to bonds, what happens to the riskiest of the risky stuff. And so depending on how you want to be allocated in front of the first cut, this is for bonds. On average, bonds tend to do pretty decent 12 months after the first cut. Are there issues with this based on how much we're issuing in the U.S. government? Absolutely, you know, but they also can't let the bond market explode. We already have this implicit yield curve control by issuing in the front end versus the long end, and probably only a matter of time until we have explicit yield curve control. Looking at the S&P 500 in election cycles, we can look at averages, we can look at all the other years as JC has put together here. This is the September, October seasonality we typically bottom out in October in election years and then do better into November and the rest of the year and that makes sense we have some certainty on the election what's going to happen after the election as opposed to before the election especially this election especially a close election where it isn't exactly clear uh, what's going to happen ahead of time at least not as we sit here in September so the S&P moving higher the Q's moving higher in September would buck this trend because clearly we are we are bearish in September. And that's coming from JC, who's definitely more bullish than your average chart person on Twitter. This is the S&P 12 months after the first rate cut. And again, this is not bearish. Sorry, it's just not. We can say, you know, there's been a recession. It's 
terrible for risk asset assets initially, but historically that is not what we've seen. I think there's definitely a recency bias with 2001, 2008. This isn't 100% positive for the S&P, but it's certainly not as bearish as I'm seeing people discuss. And that's just the data. It's just the numbers. Forward returns, post rate cut. Uh, gold quickly looks fine. You know, the thing about these decade long patterns, it's not going to reach its target in a year. It's going to take some time. Gold does look very overbought here on the high time frames. You can see the TKC clamp starting to form there, the separation of the TK lines. Looks a little rising wedgy on the high time frames. I don't know how much more there's left in gold in the near term. And again, for BTC, that's a good thing. We don't want our competition getting all the attention. So if this could settle down a little bit, just a little bit, that's certainly good for BTC. Lastly, I'll just mention the recent Michael Howell interview from Blockworks here. I'll put the link to this in the description of the video. It is deep. It is wide. I listened to it two or three times now. Um, Michael Howell is the world's liquidity expert, let's just say. If you want to go deeper on the macro side, very, very good discussion with him there. So lots of later labor data this week, CPI next week, and then the Fed meeting the week after that. That's all I have for this one. Like, dislike, comment, share, subscribe, and happy trading.